This interview is being recorded as part of the Albert and Pauline Dubin Oral History Archives at the Leonard N. Simons Jewish Community Archives. My name is Stan Moretzky and today is March 14, 2016. I have the pleasure of interviewing Senator Carl Levin in his office at the First National Building in Detroit, Michigan. Senator Levin, can you give permission to the Leonard N. Simons Jewish Community Archives to publish, duplicate, or otherwise use this recording for educational purposes and for use as deemed appropriate by the archives? I do. Thank you very much, and now let's get started. I'd like to focus on your early life in Detroit and talk about those sorts of things. So let's start with where and when you were born. I was uh, born in 1934 in June in, in Detroit. Uh, we lived then on uh, uh, LaSalle Boulevard. But uh, I guess we'll get to that with a later question. But the when and where is 1934, Detroit, Michigan. And we'd like to hear some, some, some talk about your parents, who they were and what they did in right. your family. My dad uh, was uh, originally, uh, he was born Solomon Levin. He changed his name to Saul, S-A-U-L Levin. He never liked the name Solomon for some reason. I think because people call him Saul. And he didn't like the, the resident Saul, so he changed it to Saul. A lot softer, and my dad was a softy. He was a, uh, he was a lawyer. Um, he was raised, uh, he was born in Chicago. He's one of a family of eight. His, uh, he was the second chronologically. His, the oldest member of the, uh, his generation was his big brother, Ted Levin who later became a federal judge. Uh, my dad was in law practice with Ted Levin and Bear Levin um, at the firm called Levin, Levin, Garvet and Dill. After he was born in Chicago, um, the family moved to London, Ontario. His dad was uh, active in the Cigar Makers Union in Chicago and uh, the, I guess the owners didn't like people trying to organize a union and so they uh, kicked him out, my grandpa, my dad's father lost his job and they went to uh, Ontario, you know, where they lived in London, Ontario on Gray Street. And uh, eight boys and girls with their parents uh, had a real struggle. They were, they were poor. My grandpa was, uh, again, a cigar maker in uh, London. Um, my mother was um, Bess Levin's son. Uh, her name was Levin's son. And uh, she was a, she had three brothers. Uh, they lived in Birmingham, Michigan, and she was born in Birmingham, Michigan in, in 1898. Actually, my dad was born the same year in Chicago in 1898, uh, both born in January of that year, about five days apart. But my mother's family was uh, the only Jewish family then in Birmingham, Michigan, uh, and they were fairly uh, uh, strict in terms of keeping kosher. They went in for kosher meat every Friday, I think my grandpa went in and uh, came into Detroit on the railway or a street railway and bought kosher meat. Uh, he was a he started off as a uh, peddler, so he just peddled uh, things like uh, twine and rope and uh, threads and uh, rags. Uh, he had a, a horse uh, and a buggy uh, in northern Oakland County, go around to the farms saved his pennies and ended up uh, buying the corner of Woodward and Maple, which is the corner in Birmingham, or was a few years ago. And he bought a little store called Levinson's Dry Goods, I believe, and then saved his money and bought a store next door and bought a store next door. And he ended up with four stores, all named Levinson Hardware, Levinson Dry Goods, Levinson. So we have a wonderful postcard. Uh, with uh, one Levinson store after another. And then when he retired, he um, swapped those four stores for a building down the street a little bit, still on Maple, which is still in the family. Uh, my mother was probably the only Jew ever born in Birmingham because there was no hospital in Birmingham, still is none. And so she was born in her home. And her brothers were born in a hospital in Detroit. So my, my mother, at least for decades, was probably the only Jewish person born in Birmingham. And she has uh, oral history, as a matter of fact, with the Birmingham Historical Society. 
So, and uh, I guess that's, my mother went to the University of Michigan, uh, was one of the few women in those days. Uh, she was very independent and, uh, for instance, drove, she had a driver's license, drove her big brother, Aaron Levinson, who was a lawyer, to California. He was sick, he needed warmer weather, and uh, she drove him when he moved to California. And, uh, actually did the, the driving all the way out there at a fairly young age. Um, and my dad, as I said, uh, was a, a lawyer uh, in a firm called Levin, Levin, Garvet and Dill. He was the second Levin. Uh, he then moved. Um, he never really loved the practice of law. He told us late in life he did it because his uh, brother Ted said, hey, join me in this law practice. We can make a living here and help raise this large family that we're part of. Uh, later on, he went into business, lost most of his money, which wasn't a whole lot anyway, mm -hmm. uh, in a business that he didn't know much about. And he always taught his family to uh, make sure you try to do what you love, not what you uh, are told to do by someone else or urged to do. If you have to do something for financial reasons, that's one thing, and that was his situation. But if you can afford to follow your own heart, do that. That sounds like what you did as you grew up. Well, I hope so. My, uh, and by the way, my f parents were active Zionists. My mother was very active as a volunteer in Hadassah, which was on the corner of Claremont and 12th Street, uh, above a bank. And uh, Sandy and I and our sister Hannah used to call ourselves Hadassah orphans because when we got home in the afternoon, my mother was never there. She was uh, volunteering for Hadassah. My father was an uh, active Zionist as well and active in the Jewish community. Uh, he was, I think, secretary of the Jewish uh, community center that was on Woodward. Very interesting. Uh, so your family life growing up was very oriented around Judaism. And <laughs> I'd say, I wouldn't say, that I would say it was, we were very Jewish, but I wouldn't say that, that we were, we weren't Orthodox, we were conservative Jews. Um, we were proud Jews, but I wouldn't say that we spent an awful lot of time in synagogue, because we didn't. Uh, we go there on holidays, we celebrated holidays at home, we did not keep a kosher home. Uh, I would say that uh, my, my parents, though, as I said, were active Zionists. We were not, I, I can't claim that we were ob very observant Jews, but again, we were proud Jews. Okay. Um, were you, as a child, involved in any Jewish <coughs> organizations besides your mother's uh, Hadassah? Um, no, we went to, not, a, not an organization, we went to a camp, which was basically a Jewish camp. We went to a high school, which was basically a Jewish high school. Central. But, uh, Central High. But we, I was not involved in any Jewish organization um, as a kid. Um, well, and religion didn't play that. It played an important role, but not a religious role. Yeah, and not a that. dominant role, right. I'd say. Um, I had the pleasure, as I mentioned before, I had the pleasure of hearing you speak at the old Sher Tzedek uh, synagogue about your bar mitzvah. And uh, I'd like to have you talk a little bit about that. <laughs> um, for me, it was kind of a hard job. I'm afraid to uh, learn my mafter. It was, uh, we had a wonderful teacher, a man named Gold Doftus, who was a, really a fabulous human being. And he and his wife, when my brother and I used to go there together. Uh, I don't know why my brother went with me, because he had already been bar mitzvah, probably to make sure I'd get there. We right. walked from our house on Boston Boulevard to where they lived. Um, and uh, I remember we had, there were two rabbis then that uh, were on the bima. Um, probably it took two rabbis to get me through my mafter. Um, and um, one was Rabbi Hirschman and then Rabbi Adler. Uh, but uh, it uh, was, uh, I guess, not a very notable bar mitzvah particularly. I don't know that I was very adept. I don't think I was. And uh, it's interesting. I've had trouble remembering how to read Hebrew. And I just, uh, to this day, we have a little synagogue downtown. And of course, uh, um, when we read our passages, um, I have to read them either in English or phonetically. I still have trouble reading Hebrew. And uh, uh, 
uh, it's kind of kind of a pity after all these years of going to synagogue because I we did form a synagogue actually my wife and I and a small group of uh, Jews in 1900 and um, 1900 I think and 70 that's the reconstruction formed the reconstructionist congregation of Detroit with about half dozen other people we actually formed it in my cons in my uh, synagogue uh, it was it was then called Tahia, which means Renaissance, and it, that name reflected our desire that there be a Jewish family presence, a synagogue that uh, would kind of appeal to families. Uh, there was a downtown synagogue, which was the only other synagogue in Detroit, but that was kind of kind of single guys who were older who were practicing something downtown, who who you know went uh, after work uh, to. Uh, synagogue uh, maybe just to uh, for a particular uh, uh, short time purpose not not the holidays but anyway the one other thing on that is that uh, the name Tahia which was the original name of this organization then later on a few years later joined the reconstructionist movement which is an offshoot of the conservative movement and then many years later we split and Tahia moved to uh, the suburbs. And we became the part that was left, the Reconstructionist Congregation of Detroit, RCD, which is our current name. So even though we were very small, probably 30 or 40 families at the most, mm -hmm. we did that traditional Jewish thing. We split our synagogue. <laughs> and because th those of us who remained uh, wanted to have a Jewish presence in Detroit. Now, uh, the, the uh, downtown synagogue has grown a lot in recent years, but it still, for instance, does not have high Holy Day services. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do, uh, the RCD, Reconstructionist Congregation. We do have uh, services uh, for the holidays, uh, high holidays. What led you into Reconstructionist <coughs> from conservative? My dad was a Reconstructionist, and uh, I think, and I know my Uncle Ted was a Reconstructionist. Um, it was a more progressive form of uh, conservatism. Uh, for instance, they had the first women rabbis. Um, uh, the founder of Reconstructionism, I guess, had five daughters, and if he was going to have a kid who was going to follow in his footsteps, it was going to be a girl or a woman. And uh, he, he started with the bat mitzvahs. He started, yeah. And so uh, um, my my sister was confirmed um, at Chartzedek. Uh, I married my, my Jewish wife, uh, was more Orthodox than I am. Her parents came from the old country. They were immigrants, unlike my parents. My parents were second generation. Uh, my wife Barbara's parents were first generation, were more Orthodox, more observant, kept a kosher home. And so she was raised in a more kosher, actually, environment than I was. Yeah, Reconstruction is. <laughs> Such a modern version, and it's uh, very interesting how that's developed. And uh, do you go to services regularly? Or? Well, not enough, but we have a, we have services twice a month now. We have uh, we have the high holy days services. Uh, we have other uh, holidays we celebrate, like Sukkot, um, and uh, it's a um, it kind of fits what what we are, which is. We're traditional in terms of uh, kind of wearing talises, wearing yarmulkes, speaking at least half in Hebrew, half in English usually. Um, if you come into a reconstru reconstructionist synagogue, it kind of looks like a very observant synagogue, um, as a matter of fact, um, because we, we observe the, uh, the, the religion. We obviously observe our religion. We're Jewish, and very proud, but we're not uh, uh, we don't speak solely in Hebrew. Uh, we're, we're very we're progressive in terms of our uh, our programs. Our services, for instance, are kind of interactive. Uh, after uh, reading the Torah service, we'll usually have a discussion about the Torah service. Sometimes that'll be a very lively discussion, and it'll sometimes get into politics, for instance. Uh, we're a liberal group, a progressive group, usually politically. Um, but uh, that's not a requirement to belong to the Reconstructionists. I'm sure we got mostly Democrats, but a few Republicans have slipped in there as well. 
Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, well, it, it, as your high school years and you're active, and then you went on to <coughs> which university? I went to Swarthmore College. One other thing about my uh, high school, uh, um, if I would, sort of a Jewish footnote, uh, when I was running for my class officer, uh, treasurer, um, the, we were wearing billboards. The kids would walk around the school wearing signs who they were for because we had regular campaigns for president and vice president, treasurer of our class, secretary. So my billboard was a that I that my supporters wore around their necks with a piece of string and a piece of cardboard had a piece of matzah on it, and it said, "This is what happens to bread without leaven." Oh, fantastic. L E V I N. And I had that, I kept one of those billboards for many, many, many years, as a matter of fact. But it helped elect me, and that's my, my earliest elective office was helped well, you still uh, have one produce. Of those, the, the archives would love to have <laughs> yeah, that in the right collection. I, I haven't had it for many years now. Kept it for many years. But it's, um, it was uh, all of my buddies from Central High School, we talk about a lot of things. We get together a lot, uh, as my family does. Uh, we have a very large family, as I mentioned. My dad was one of eight, but there's probably 25 cousins that I have in that family. And uh, for uh, many, uh, for we got together for reunions until very recently, family reunions. And I assume you probably went to Durfee. Junior went to High. Durfee, right, and to uh, Roosevelt. Actually started in Brady Elementary, then Roosevelt. Uh, back to college, I went to a college called Swarthmore in uh, Pennsylvania, a little town outside of Philadelphia, a little Quaker school, traditionally. It's not a very observant Quaker school, but its, it's origin was Quaker, and um, it was a great college, still is a fabulous college, and I loved it. What led you there? I can't really remember how I happened to, to go there. Um, uh, had great campus when we were visiting campuses. Um, my, uh, uh, I know we were taken by the campus, and it's uh, a it's a liberal arts school. It's it's one of a group of liberal arts schools like uh, Antioch and Oberlin and uh, um, Kalamazoo College, and it's sort of this great small liberal arts school. So I wanted to go to a small school, which it was about a thousand students, and I think I also wanted to. Uh, be a, a little way from home, as close as our family is. I think I kind of wanted to go to a place not right nearby home. I thought maybe it would, uh, I'd have more independence somehow, psychologically or otherwise. Was there much of a Jewish life on that campus? Uh, there was some, uh, not particularly um, uh, strong. I remember taking my non-Jewish girlfriend to a synagogue in Chester. I uh, wanted to show her what a synagogue looked like, and uh, uh, so we uh, spent one Saturday morning in, a, in an Orthodox synagogue. And I remember very vividly when they uh, asked me, you know, what uh, what are you? And I said, what's your name? I said, Levin. Now you're a Levi. Come on, come on up to the bima. We want you to have a, a Leah. And I said, <laughs> unless you got it, unless you got it phonetically, I'm afraid that I, I won't be able to. Read the Aaliyah, uh, and uh, to read, the, I can't read the Torah in any event. So they uh, understood. I've been through that same situation. Yeah. I really understand. Oh, it can be embarrassing. You know, you're very Jewish, but you can't read Hebrew. It's sort of how do you explain that? Yeah. So you majored in basic liberal liberal arts. Majored in political science there, and uh, then went on from there to law school at Harvard. Uh, where my brother Sandy uh, had, uh, was already there. Uh, he was in his third year when I began my first year. So we roomed together, as we had as kids, by the way. My brother and I are extremely close. Uh, always have been very close. Uh, he's an amazing big brother, an amazing human being, but he's just a, an extraordinary big brother who always involved me and my gang and his games with his gang. So even though he's three years older than I am, you know, we had basketball games and football games and baseball. We were athletes and uh, we loved sports. And so the group, two groups would 
come together and we just split the younger guys, my group, with the older guys, his group. And, uh, but he always included them. We traveled together as kids as soon as he got his driver's license. Sandy and I, uh, he, he's driving, he drove, I can't drive, I was only 13 or 14, so. But as soon as he had a license, we drove off to the Upper Peninsula, we drove to Washington, uh, um, but he and, he and I spent uh, a lot of time together. We drove out west together, we drove cabs together, we did everything together. Wow. I knew you were close, I didn't realize that. that close. <coughs> Excuse me. That's interesting. So you did a lot of traveling then as a kid too, so yeah, the country. We did. My dad was a consul from Honduras, represented, or consul, excuse me, for Honduras. My father spoke Spanish. He taught Spanish to uh, World War II Navy flyers um, who were, I guess, being based down in Central America. And he then was appointed an honorary consul for Honduras in Detroit, which he was until he, he passed away. Um, well, after several years, you started, after law school, you came back to Detroit, started in a law practice, and what firm were you with, or was it on your own? No, I was with a firm of, it was called uh, Grossman, Hyman, and Grossman, a little firm in the, uh, first the David Stott building downtown, then came the first national building. Uh, and it was a small firm. I think there were only five of us at the time. Um, and uh, just packed general practice. I then also, with an, uh, a friend of mine from high school, opened up a, uh, a little street front office, storefront office on 12th Street. So I actually practiced in two places. One downtown uh, with the Grossman, Hyman and Grossman in the First National Building, but also then um, had a small walk-in office on uh, 12th Street right at Claremont, actually right where the riot began in 1967. Uh, so a man named Mar uh, Marvin Gerber and I opened up a firm. So I was actually at a, in two places at one time practicing law. Now you're back to the First National Building. It's kind of like you've come full circle here. <laughs> it does, right. But you then, while you were practicing law, then got involved with politics and started with the Detroit City Council. Right, I've been active in politics. My brother, of course, was uh, active in the 60s. Uh, he was in the state legislature and the state senate, where he was elected in 64, uh, I believe, 1964. Mm -hmm. We've been active in the Kennedy campaign. Um, here in 1960, we were active in the gubernatorial campaigns here, the Democratic campaigns. Uh, I had been active in college uh, in the uh, campaigns for Stevenson in the 1950s. And then in 19, uh, the late 50s, I was active uh, uh, in a presidential campaign also from Harvard for uh, Stevenson. And then when I got active myself, my brother had already again been in the state legislature uh, for uh, six years by then. He was chairman of the Michigan Democratic Party. Um, I was, by that time, when I ran for council, I had moved from private practice to first the Michigan Civil Rights Commission where I was their attorney for about three years from 1964 to 1967 roughly, and then helped open up, or 1966, and then I opened, helped to open up the Legal Aid and Defender's Office uh, in 1966 and was there for about uh, three years, uh, headed the appellate division at the Legal Aid and Defender's Office, and then ran for city council in 1969. And what made you decide to get, I mean, you've been involved with all these liberal causes and involved with things, suddenly decide to get into politics? Well, we always loved politics. My brother, of course, was in politics. Right. My father, mother, uh, my sister Hannah, who was also in politics very heavily. Her, her husband was the chairman of his Democratic district in northwest Detroit. His name was Bill Gladstone. My uh, sister Hannah 
um, was active in my brother's campaigns and in my campaigns and her husband's efforts to become chair of that Democratic district. Uh, but I think the most immediate thing that uh, caused me to run was the um, fact that Detroit had been torn up by riots in 1967. And then, because I had been active in the civil rights community as lawyer for the Civil Rights Commission, and then in the uh, poverty community, uh, the, representing uh, indigents who couldn't afford their attorneys, uh, a lot of people suggested I run for city council as somebody who might be able to uh, get support in both the uh, white and the African American communities, and then thereby perhaps help to heal the city. Uh, to be one of the ways in which we could heal the city would be to have a uh, city council which uh, was biracial. And so I ran in 1969, was elected, began to serve January of 70 for uh, four years, and then was re-elected uh, at the end of 73. And so I uh, may be a year off here. And then in my second time, I came in first in the city and thereby became president of the city council. Who was the mayor then? The first mayor was Ray Gribbs in my first term. In the second term, it was Coleman Young. Interesting. Yeah. So I served as city council president in uh, Coleman Young's first term as mayor. Can you talk a little bit about that, even though we weren't going to get too much into the politics, but Coleman Young was such a, uh, an interesting person to this city. Yeah, he uh, was very proud African American. He was the first African American elected as mayor. Um, we got along fine personally, politically, because I was the head of the legislative branch, city council, and he was the executive branch head, the mayor. We, of course, had differences, which are fairly normal between legislative and executive branches. Uh, we had differences as to what his powers were and what our powers were. We had a couple uh, charter amendment uh, uh, differences where the whole city council was for a charter amendment of a certain kind and he opposed it because he thought that would take away from his power. And uh, But we, we got along uh, well. And, um, uh, but the city, the city uh, saw a, uh, began long before that, began even before the riot, but uh, starting in the 60s, the city saw a real decline in white population. Later on, in the 70s, uh, began to see a decline in African American population as well, uh, and began a, uh, um, a long series of uh, dwindling populations and, pr and increasing problems that are the result of a lot of things, but mainly poverty. Um, and um, now as we talk here, we see a city kind of roaring back. Uh, this, this city is amazing now, it's, it's what's happening here. But it's, uh, That was my, going to be my next question to you. How are you enjoying, how are you seeing the rebirth of Detroit that's going on? It's an amazing phenomenon. Uh, I've always fought for this town. I, um, you know, born here, educated here, um, uh, represented the city on the city council uh, for eight years. Uh, when I went to Washington during those 36 years, uh, uh, of course, I represented the whole state, not just Detroit, but I obviously had a special uh, feel about my hometown, and so I, I was able to get a lot done uh, in terms of earmarks, financial support for Detroit, down on the riverfront, uh, helped uh, in terms of getting the M1 rail going, but in a lot of other ways was able to get some special funding uh, for Detroit. And, but at the same time I was able to do that, I saw the city gradually lose population and have greater and greater problems, mainly in neighborhoods that were being uh, destroyed by vacant buildings. Um, and then uh, vacant land. Um, and then I, I still, despite those problems, uh, said our city will someday come back. I was always optimistic that someday this city would come back, but I didn't see evidence of it until recently. And then I'd say starting a few years ago, um, things began to happen, mainly young people uh, moving into the city. 
and young people saw here uh, a way of um, being with other young people, being in an exciting place, being in a place where there's lots of music and sports and events, where our riverfront has come back strong, so we have a great river walk now. Um, we have Midtown coming back strong, where there's a great university uh, and a number of other things that are going on in Midtown, where our medical center, uh, uh, medical centers are located from downtown or Midtown all the way out to Ford Hospital. But there's a, a real momentum here. Restaurants opening all seems like one a week. My wife and I go out. We now go. We say we're going out one thir every Thursday. We're going out to dinner to a different restaurant, and we stay. We stick inside the city, and uh, we can't keep up with the new restaurant. Well, you've remained a resident of Detroit all of your life. Right. We've always lived here. We and lived. You lived down in the Lafayette. Lafayette Park. Park. Uh, we're in the process of moving a few blocks away to a place where we can buy our residence in a high rise. We've been renting uh, for 36 years down in Lafayette Park. We always owned our house in Northwest Detroit before I was elected to the Senate. Um, but then we uh, had to buy a house in Washington because we were raising our kids there most of the time. We're, there, so we bought a larger place there, a house, but we rented our apartment uh, here uh, in Lafayette Park, where we've lived for 36, 37 years now. And, but finally we're able to, it's hard to find a place downtown, believe me, there's a huge demand for places, but finally a few months ago we found a place we liked, bigger than our current rental, uh, and we could own it as uh, owners, uh, part owners of a co-op. So we own shares in a co-op at 1300 East Lafayette now. And, oh, very nice. Yeah, great views of the river and watch our city, uh, city's comeback. Well, with, are any of your children involved in politics? I know you have three daughters, right? I have three daughters, three sons-in-law, six grandkids, two per daughter and son-in-law. Um, they, um, none of them are involved in politics. Or any, are they involved in communities? Oh yeah, they're all involved one way or another in their communities. Uh, they're raising their kids though, that keeps them busy, but they're involved in education in their own hometowns. They're scattered. Uh, my uh, older, oldest daughter, uh, Kate, is the president of the McGregor Fund here in Detroit. Uh, her uh, husband is a physician, teaches at the University of Michigan. They live in Ann Arbor. She commutes daily to Detroit. Uh, to uh, come to the place where she works at the McGregor Fund. Our middle daughter uh, lives north of New York City, uh, married uh, to an Israeli, as a matter of fact. They live in a town called uh, Nyack, New York. Mm -hmm. uh, and our third daughter uh, lives in Pittsburgh. It's a bit of traveling to see the same thing. It is a lot of traveling. When we lived in Washington, it was, uh, we were able to get a lot to New York, so we saw that particular daughter and her family a lot, but now we see, uh, now that we're full-time back home, we see our family in Ann Arbor more than any, uh, any of the other ones. Well, when you were first, you were the first Jewish senator in Michigan elected to uh, the U.S. Senate, and you were one of sen seven Jewish senators when you took office. Um, did you have a support group there, or did you have a kind of a minion of Jewish senators? Well, we uh, we did meet when the Jew, when the Israeli prime minister or a major Israeli figure came to town. The Israeli embassy in Washington asked whoever was the senior Jewish senator to bring the Jewish members together, and the same thing on the House side with the senior member, Jewish member of the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we'd meet senators and Jewish House members, uh, but sometimes separately. And then we, uh, there were more Jewish senators as time went on. I think we grew up to as many as 13. I became the senior Jewish senator, so I was the convener at that time. Back to, uh, I know you want to talk about politics, but my father-in-law gave me a couple great uh, opening lines, uh, um, you know, running as a Jew in Michigan, there, I don't think there ever had been a Jewish statewide official. Now, I may be wrong. You guys can check your archives and find out. My brother would have been the first Jewish governor 
had he won, and he came close in the 1970s. Um, but uh, um, when I became, when I was running uh, for Senate uh, in uh, 1969 or 70, and I may have gotten my year mixed up, um, my father-in-law uh, gave me a great opening line because people were saying, well, no, okay, he's a Jewish guy running statewide. You know, can a Jew get elected statewide in Michigan? And so, of course, I felt definitely yes, because my brother almost won. And not only that, uh, people really vote for the person, not for the religion of that person. And so my father-in-law said, hey, I'll tell you, I'll give you a great opening line to let everybody know you're Jewish and that you get beyond that issue and talk about issues. Uh, so I was always running late to the meetings, uh, the political meetings and rallies and so forth. And so when I'd arrive late, I'd say, I hope you're running on Jewish time here tonight. And I'd get a little nervous laugh, you know. And I said, let me tell you, for those of you who don't know what Jewish time is, let me tell you what Jewish time is. <laughs> I said, uh, I was in Israel a couple years ago, and I picked up the phone to get the time, see what time it was because of the time change between here and Israel. And the voice at the other, recording at the other end of the telephone said, at the tone, the time will be 8.30. 8.45 at the latest. <laughs> <laughs> Since we're always, you know, Jews are famous for being late. It turns out every other, every other quote group is, has their own late times, yeah. uh, late time jokes of being late for everything. I mean, there's Italian time. There's, uh, you know, every ethnic group apparently seems to have a tradition of having a little story about it. We're always late. We Italians, or we Germans, or we this, or we we uh, African Americans. You know, we're always late. So everybody has their own story about running on their own time. So I was on Jewish time. But you won, and then you became now the senior se the senior Jewish senator, yep. or what? Were, you were. Right. Um, how did your Jewish background influence your thinking and your votes in in, uh, in the Senate and your activities there? Well, there's a tradition uh, in Judaism of uh, repairing the world, trying to leave the world better than you found it. Tikkun Olam is uh, something we were raised with. Uh, we had our own uh, charities that we favored. Our, our parents were strong supporters of Federation. Uh, again, they were Zionists. But the, the, the tradition I was raised in, it was a progressive uh, tradition of Judaism, uh, of social, con social conscience, of uh, caring about the underdog, caring about uh, people who were poor or didn't have enough to eat or didn't have enough clothing. Um, and so that's what I was raised in. We were, my brother, I, my, our sister, uh, we're, we were raised as uh, Roosevelt Democrats. Um, we were progressive Democrats. And so, uh, and that has always been my view, is that we have a responsibility to our brothers and sisters, and that means literally uh, people. Because if we're all the children of one God, we're all brothers and sisters, and not just within our own community, uh, do we have a special obligation inside the Jewish community to take care of our own. First take care of your family, then take care, do what you can to help your community. But then the broader community uh, is, your, is also your responsibility, and so you know, the votes on obviously various subjects, whether it's uh, programs involving uh, education or um, involving jobs or food programs. Uh, my instincts, um, which were a part of me as uh, raised as a proud Jew, were to, to have a social conscience, to seek social justice, to care about. My father, by the way, was on the uh, Corrections Commission. So he was on the Prisons Commission, and so he used to visit prisoners. Uh, I remember once he told me that he had, um, he had Passover with the Jewish prisoners, and I carried on that tradition. I went to Jackson Prison one, one time only, but I did it uh, uh, to meet with the Jewish prisoners. Not, not a lot of them, by the way, uh, very few, but there were a lot of non-Jewish prisoners who wanted to see what a 
Passover service was like. And so we had maybe 20 or 30 people there, some of whom weren't Jewish but claimed that they were Jewish in some way or another, that they could get in and have a, have a, see what it was all about. Um, but at any rate, uh, the, um, I think in terms of the uh, taking care of the world obligation that uh, we leave the physical world uh, hopefully uh, is if possible better than we found it. That gets into the whole question of climate change and whether we have a responsibility to the earth. So I got I'm very active in the environmental uh, issues that were in the Senate, uh, very active in protecting the Great Lakes for instance, uh, uh, got a lot of funding to protect the Great Lakes and the Detroit River, uh, to clean up the lakes. Uh, so there's that environmental responsibility. Uh, my brother and I worked uh, on the assembly line uh, a couple summers, um, uh, where we, uh, I think, learned a lot about uh, how people really have to scrape by, even if they have a good job. Uh, we, we drove cabs for a couple summers at least one summer, probably two, um, when we were in, in uh, law school. Um, and as cab drivers come into contact with all kinds of people. So you, our upbringing uh, was not only our, our training that we have responsibilities uh, as citizens um, and as Jews, but our early jobs kind of reinforced the idea that uh, the, the strength that we have as a diverse people, that diversity in America is a strength, mm -hmm. that everybody, every group with different backgrounds can contribute to the whole with their histories, uh, with their strengths. Um, and uh, that was also part of it. But uh, um, I would say that the, the, the Jewish upbringing um, was very much a part of my conscience. Um, uh, the, the little guy is first and foremost in my thinking. Uh, the average, Harry Truman might have called it, the, he had a word for it. Uh, the, um, I think he said the average American, uh, the, the little guy uh, who's struggling, um, I think comes out of a Jewish upbringing to care about that person uh, and to realize that uh, people when they have hard times uh, can need a hand and, and that, that has got to be treated with dignity. When you were living in Washington did you belong to a, a congregation there like a reconstruction? No, we, we went to services on holidays if we were there. We went to Jewish services on uh, Yom Kippur and on uh, Rosh Hashanah when, if we were there. But if we were back here, of course, we went to our own synagogue. Uh, first, uh, Tahia, and then the RCT Reconstructionist Congregation. Because we had our own services here that we were very, very involved with. Uh. Okay. Um, I'll read you a, a, a A 1984 Jewish Forward article quoted your mother saying about you and your brother, if you really want me to be proud of you two, then hurry and stop the arms race, solve the budget crisis, and bring peace to the Middle East. It's from your first term as a senator until your retirement. Do you feel you've made any progress in these areas to towards your mother's statement? I thought you were going to quote another statement. I'll get back to that one. But my, my mother had a statement which was uh, summed her up. Um, she was a very private person, unlike my dad. And I'll get back to that in a minute while I try to figure out how to duck the answer, how to duck <laughs> that question. My mother had a famous comment uh, once. My brother was elected uh, in 1984, uh, and so there were two of us in the Congress. Then, starting in '84. Um, all the way until I retired. Uh, and so he, uh, my, my mother was asked by a reporter once, uh, you've got two sons in the Congress. You must be bursting your buttons with pride. And my mother's answer was, if that's what they want, it's okay with me. <laughs> <laughs> now. She didn't become a doctor. <laughs> 
No, no, no. She, what she's saying is, whatever her kids do, she's for. And she didn't want to indicate any kind of uh, preference or any kind of uh, the difference in attitude towards two sons who happened to be in the Congress from her daughter, who is working at the medical center and raising a couple great kids. So she didn't want to say anything which would indicate any kind of a difference in support <laughs> or love. She says, okay, so they're in the Congress. They want it, hey, that's fine with me. But anyway, now, now to her other comment. Yeah. Give me those one at a time. You got four things there. Yeah. If you really want me to be proud of you two, then hurry and stop the arms race. Okay, well, the arms and race, the I, arms we, I did it all by myself, yeah. right? Yeah. No, I mean, nobody can take credit for stopping the arms race, uh, including Ronald Reagan, uh, who never took credit himself for stopping it, but people give him credit for stopping uh, the Cold War, at least. The arms race was stopped by a series of um, uh, arms control agreements, essentially, and by the end of the Cold War, those two things. And I obviously supported the arms treaties very strongly, arms reductions very strongly. I was chairman, as you mentioned, for about a decade of the Senate Armed Services Committee at the end of my career, where I always very much uh, supported arms reductions, particularly nuclear arms reductions. Um, I can't take much credit for ending the arms race, but at least I uh, lend whatever support I could to, in that direction, particularly uh, in terms of nuclear weapons reductions. What was the second one? Budget crises. But, uh, well, actually, we made some progress at the end of the Clinton years, and I was a part of that, one part of it. Um, at the end of the Clinton years, uh, uh, we actually balanced the budget for two straight years, and it was done and this is a partisan comment, and it'll be maybe the only partisan comment I'll make during this interview, but it was done without one Republican vote. The Clinton budget, which raised the gas tax a little bit, raised the tax on upper income people a little bit, reduced spending in a number of areas, led to, number one, strong economic growth, but number two, to a balanced budget in his last two years. Those were the only two years that the balance, the budget was balanced. But we won that vote by one vote and without one Republican. Not one Republican would vote for the Clinton budget. And it took the vice president of the United States to break a tie. Al Gore was president. He had to come and vote. He rarely voted, but he did do that. And the Speaker of the House, who was then a Democrat, who almost never votes, had to come and vote. And there was a one vote margin in both houses. And so every one of us who voted for that budget, because it won by one vote, can take a little bit of credit for balancing the budget. And I'll take a little bit of credit for that, because I very much supported the Clinton budgets. Now, what was the, th you know, and I, and I basically have been fairly cautious uh, in the area of uh, budget. I, I have believed, for instance, that when we had a surplus at the end of the Clinton budgets, that we should apply that to deficit reduction, at least in part. We had, big, we had a big national debt that had been built up, but we had two surpluses. We could have used and should have used some of those surpluses to reduce the national debt. Mm -hmm. We didn't do it. Why? Because Bush came to office, and what was his slogan? Hey, those surpluses are all your money, and so he handed them back in tax cuts, mainly favoring upper-income people which I opposed also. In other words, we should not have even had tax cuts to the degree we did. We should have used some of the surplus, <coughs> excuse me, some of the surplus for debt reduction. But if we're gonna have tax cuts, we should have helped middle income people, not upper income people. So uh, that, that's a comment on budget. I was, I was fairly cautious about uh, spending money. Number three of my mother's list Bring peace to the Middle Please. East. Yeah, we have not done that. And uh, <coughs> although I, I must tell you, I'm a strong believer in a two-state solution. I think it's the only way uh, that there's going to be a solution. Uh, it didn't lead to uh, peace. Surely we have not had peace in the Middle East. Uh, there's been some peace between uh, Israel and Egypt. Uh, and uh, I actually um, 
was at the signing ceremony. I, I was elected in 1978, and it was there in 79 when uh, Sadat uh, and the Begin and Carter uh, in the Rose Garden signed an agreement. So I was there as a senator. So did I support that? Obviously, I supported it. Nothing. I had nothing to do with it, but I supported it. Same thing. Um, um, with uh, Jordan, I've been a strong supporter of Jordan, an aide to Jordan, who has made peace with Israel. So you've got two countries there, which in any way I could, including arms, have helped to support both Egypt and Jordan after they made peace with Israel. But in terms of the other uh, countries and things that are going on, uh, we are a long way, I'm afraid, from uh, peace uh, between Israel and the rest of her neighbors. In terms of the other parts of the Middle East, um, there surely is no peace. There's, there's more violence there now than there was uh, even five years ago. Uh, Arab Spring led to uh, Arab uh, uh, disaster uh, in a lot of ways. Um, and uh, I... Um, we, we're far from achieving that, uh, I must tell you. But uh, so I, but we, you know, you got to keep working at it. You can't give up. Uh, you can't give up on uh, trying to find a way uh, to bring peace to Iraq. It's created a huge refugee problem. You can't give up on um, Iran joining uh, the. Uh, uh, other nations of the world stop supporting terrorism. Uh, part of the Iranian um, government is moving in the right direction. The other part, the Revolutionary Guard, is moving still in the wrong direction, supporting terrorism. But there's been some things happening even inside Iran which over time uh, can move that country in the right direction. So it's not a done deal by a long stretch, and there's steps forward and steps backward. But that recent election Iran, in Iran showed that at least the younger generation in Iran wants something other than a future dominated by the uh, Revolutionary Guard. Do you think they'll be able to accomplish any of those goals? Uh, not, probably not in my lifetime, uh, but over time, yes. Um, uh, I do. Uh, the, uh, and, and you know, even uh, Netanyahu, uh, back in 19, he came, he, it was right before the, uh, uh, right before the Iraq war. And he, he was not prime minister then. He had been prime minister and I guess had lost. And he came and he was lobbying Congress, this Netanyahu, in 19, in 2000, and, uh, wow, i got to get my year. 2000, it was right before the Iraq War. So I think it would have been the end of 2002. He came and he actually lobbied Congress to support President Bush to go to war in Iraq, which was a mistake in my judgment, yeah. a fundamental mistake that the so-called neocons in the Bush administration I think talked Bush into, didn't take much trouble and work, but nonetheless were the, the big impetus for uh, going to war in Iraq, which again I think has been one of the causes of all the chaos in the Middle East. But my point here is, getting to the Iranian, back to the Iranian question, when Netanyahu testified in December of 2002, urging Congress to support President Bush in going to Iraq, which he was considering then, Netanyahu said something which will sound mighty strange 50, 12 years later. He said, the young people in Iran can make some real progress in Iran against the Revolutionary Guard. So don't attack Iran, Netanyahu was saying, attack Iraq. And why not attack Iran? Because even though you had these extremists on top, you had this younger generation in Iran. This is Netanyahu. Mm -hmm. Not, not uh, Obama in 2015. This is Netanyahu in 2002 
saying the same thing that it was something which is true. There is in the younger generation in Iran a desire to move towards the West and to end the, the fanaticism of the uh, of the guard, of the uh, revolutionary guard in Iran. So I do have hope, and I, uh, in the elections in Iran, um, which are relatively free, a number of people aren't allowed to run, but there's enough moderates running, pro-Western people, they're not pro-Western exactly, but they're much more pro-Western than the than the Ayatollahs and the, pro and the Revolutionary Guard. That younger generation, against the wishes of the Revolutionary Guard, are voting for more pro-Western type people. So I, I do have some there hope. There is some hope, though. There is some hope, yeah. I'm not naive, by the way. I'm not a dove. I'm a hawk in a lot of ways. Um, I, I believe in the use of force at times. I believed in going to war in Afghanistan, for instance. I believed in... Uh, and what we did in the Balkans, using force to get rid of a Serbian dictator. Uh, so I do support the use of force. I am not someone who's dovish, particularly. On the other hand, I do believe that you got to be very careful before you use military action, because it can unleash all kinds of consequences which you don't want. And that's what the Iraq war, again, which I opposed, uh, did. Well, what's happening now? And it's, we see those consequences right now, I'm afraid. You've worked extensively with other cultural groups, Arab American, Polish communities. How do you approach interaction with a group that shares ideal, ide, ideas different from your own and generate meaningful communication? In other words, you've been involved with a lot of things. Sure. And well, the ideas that, that govern good people are basically the same ideas. The religions may be different, the ethnic origin may be different, but the ideals and the ideas of good people and decent people are the same. They want to live in peace. They want to have an opportunity for their kids, maybe better than theirs. They're willing, they're patriotic people. Some of the most patriotic people you could ever find are immigrants, including our own people, our own Jewish immigrants. I mean, you want to talk about patriotism, you know, look inside of our community, but you look in any community. You've got patriotic people. Look who's in the army. Look who fights. Look who puts the uniform on. It's every single one of the groups that are part of America. And so I've seen firsthand there are b really bad people in every group. You know, there's yeah. obviously there are, there are Muslim terrorists, there are Italian mafia, there are you name it. We had Jewish mafia, by the way. I won't, you know, when it, it was a Jew, it was a Jew who, who killed Rabin. Right. So, you know, there, 95 percent of people of all religions, ethnic groups, are good, decent people who have the same ideals, maybe not the same ideas, but the same ideals, okay, um, that uh, all other people have. So that makes me hopeful and optimistic. I'm going to have to leave you thinking about it. Okay, I'll be right there. Okay, a um, well, couple last questions. In your 36 years as a senator, what are your proudest accomplishments? It's a long list. It may be a short question, but it's a long list. Um, in terms of specific accomplishments, I'd say anything that was positive relative to jobs for Michigan. And that is a, a long list. Armed Services Committee getting a major support, for instance, uh, for our uh, Tank and Automotive Command, for research and development programs, for getting the uh, auto industry and uh, the private sector together with government. Uh, I was deeply involved in moving from a uh, philosophy which said that government and the private sector should not work together, that believe it or not, Believe it or not, 30 years ago, the conservative theology in this country was that for government to work, to pick a, a private sector anything, to do something was picking winners and losers. Um, you, you can't do that. That runs against a conservative theology about keeping government and the private sector separate. It was called um, industrial policy 
That was a bad word. Well, I was very active in bringing mainly the big three and our military vehicle world together so that there's all kinds of joint development of research and uh, research projects, okay? We got over that. I was very much involved in that. Um, so there's a lot of things in the jobs area that I was very much involved with as chairman of the Armed Services Committee. Um, I'm very proud of the parks that we created in, in Michigan, two new parks, one up in the Upper Peninsula, uh, one in uh, off Alpena, one is an historical park. You folks know about history. This is an historical park up in the UP, in Copper Country. Mm -hmm. It's called the Keweenaw National Historical Park. And the, uh, the one, uh, the, the, uh, we created a, um, uh, in Alpena, in the lakes, a, a way of preserving um, the shipwrecks that are there. And so we have a national uh, the word escapes me at the moment. I'll think of it in a moment. Um, the uh, uh, Thunder Bay, um, Thunder Bay, Thunder not a water. conservancy. Yeah. Now we also have done a lot of other um, things in the area of the environment, uh, protecting the Great Lakes. I got it, helped to get a lot of funding uh, to clean up the Great Lakes. Um, uh, helped to get a law passed which would uh, control what could be put into the Great Lakes. Um, we created, uh, John Dingle was really active in a number of these things uh, down in uh, uh, down in Monroe, a, a battlefield, National Historical Battlefield. Uh, along the river we created a uh, refuge, an international refuge between ourselves and Canada. Uh, John Dingle led the way in the House on that. Um, I'm very uh, proud, we also have a national trail, the longest trail in the country is um, called the North Country Trail, which I was kind of the godfather of as well. So there's a lot of environmental things <coughs> which were done. I was very proud of getting the funding that uh, we got for, the, around, for various projects around the state, <coughs> including the Detroit River where I got uh, tens of millions of dollars literally uh, for the river walk for acquisition of a number of other projects on the river. I was very active in uh, helping to get the M1 rail project uh, uh, functioning. So there's a lot of things in Detroit and around the state uh, that I'm very proud of. I'm very proud of the ethics laws that I uh, got passed. Uh, when I first got there, I saw that there was uh, a lot of big gifts that were being given to members. For instance, uh, lobbyists would give World Series tickets uh, to uh, members well, those tickets are worth hundreds of dollars. And so I was the key sponsor, uh, the initiator of a, of a gifts rule prohibiting gifts, except for minimal things like hot dogs or something like that, but the minimal gifts. So I, we have a, a new gift law, not so new anymore. It's about 25 years old, but that was my law. We also controlled the, uh, didn't control so much, but we required lobbyists to disclose who it is they're lobbying for. That was my law. It was the lobbying disclosures law, disclosure law, lobbyists disclosure act, which passed. And so now uh, the media can go, anyone can go and look up who the registered lobbyists are, who they contributed to, and for what purpose. Uh, we uh, uh, can do uh, that as uh, well because of the, this is another ethics law, uh, which I uh, got involved in. Uh, so um, now those are, you know, I hate to, to select things. I, I, I think that the, what I did for Israel, I'm very proud of, and that was uh, to get a lot of additional money uh, for their rocket, uh, their uh, rocket defense program, Iron missile Dome. defense program, including, sorry? Iron Dome. Iron Dome uh, was one of them. Arrow was another one. And the third one is David Sling. So on the Armed Services Committee, um, I was able to lead the way to additional uh, support for those three programs which have really been critical in defending Israel against the rockets which have come uh, mainly from Gaza. Uh, and I've been given a, uh, an award for that uh, support for Israeli defense. We did that as a joint program with Israel and the United States. A number of other joint programs uh, with Israel and the United States in terms of uh, joint uh, um, activities, uh, joint training and exercise between uh, Israel and the United States. Uh, um, and some of this gets classified, but I think I can say the joint uh, 
the uh, location of a lot of equipment, uh, U.S. equipment in Israel, uh, getting ready for, if necessary, uh, going against Iran, for instance. If should Iran ever get to a nuclear weapon, and by, by the way, I was very much in favor of the uh, deal with Iran because I thought, and I believe still very strongly, um, that uh, that agreement uh, has kept Iran from moving towards a nuclear weapon. And at the end of 10 years, if she decides to reverse course and go towards a nuclear weapon, all bets are off. We're then free to do whatever we want to do to stop her and what Israel wants to do to stop her from going to a nuclear weapon. So I, I, was, I thought that was the right move. Uh, but, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, in terms of uh, what I'm proudest of, I wouldn't pick out any one thing. I guess, uh, uh, you know, fighting for my home state uh, in a way which uh, preserved uh, the integrity of the office is uh, something I'd have to put on the list as well. I know our time is short for you and your appointment, but the last question I'd like to ask you is who are the four or five most influential people in your life, your career? That I knew. So you're not talking about who was a role model. You're not talking about presidents, you know, like Lincoln Roosevelt. You're saying who personally in my life. Uh, I would say... Um, my, um, and I, someone who I knew, uh, would be my, my parents, my, uh, uh, my brother, um, maybe family, actually. Um, um, they'd all be family members, you know, wife and kids. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go far beyond the family for the most influential, if that's what you're asking for. Uh, um, I think politically, I put uh, for people again that I actually personally knew. I'd say Phil Hart would be on that list, um, who uh, was in the Senate before me, who was kind of the conscience of the Senate from Michigan. Um, I, he would be up there. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank you. Sure. Very, very much. It's been fascinating doing this with you. I really appreciate the opportunity. And I know that those who will hear and listen to this will learn a lot from you. Well, uh, glad to do it. Thing. Pleasure to do it. Thank you very much. Sure.